Gear up. You obviously don't understand what a missing link is. Why is it every time I see Sable Chicken's performance trying to impersonate me, I have this irresistible urge to, uh, stamp it to a Slim Jim? But of course she's right. You don't know what a transitional species is. One minute you say that Ida is just a lemur, no different than any other, and the next minute you say that the evil atheist conspiracy has falsified the fossil somehow. Why would we do that just to make her another lemur? Then you say that it wouldn't matter if she was legitimately different because you'd never accept any criteria that qualifies anything as a transitional species anyway. One of the things that makes Ida supposedly a transitional creature is that she's missing the tooth comb. Her skull has been crushed. Her teeth, right and left, are smashed together. Where is the tooth comb? Well, you, you have to use your imagination. We can easily assume that there still is a tooth comb here, which keeps this creature in the lemur family. You're determined to assume that, no matter how wrong it is. I try not to assume anything, especially without basis. You also have to ignore the fact that despite having all her teeth, left and right, crushed together, there are still obvious spaces between them that couldn't possibly exist if there was ever a tooth comb in this animal's mouth. You don't have enough imagination to conjure a tooth comb or a toilet claw either, another thing you conveniently omitted from your diatribe. You at least admitted that Ida does in fact have a talus bone, so she has anthropoid characters and lacks all the definitive traits exclusive of lemurs. So she's neither strepsirine nor haplorine, but a morphological link between them both, just as science predicted and your superstition can't dismiss. Ida has been manipulated. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Sadly, there's no doubt in your mind that the whole world was covered by a single flood just a few thousand years ago, but that's another thing we know for certain never happened. I'd like to make another video series proving that, but to adequately make my point, it would have to be a half a dozen episodes explaining all the proof against the flood from meteorology, geology, biology, ecology, archaeology, comparative mythology, and physics. Suffice for the moment to say that it was a local event in a polytheistic culture, and that the story was eventually exaggerated to something unbelievably silly. Here's a classic example of how evolutionists will deceive their audience by doing a comparison like this. You have the human foot and Ida's foot. You recognize this iconic foot now, I'm sure, but they're not the same size. We blow, what's happened here is the evolutionist has blown up this foot and put it next to a artist's rendering of a human foot to give you the illusion that they're the same size. No, I compared those images to prove you were wrong earlier when you said Ida's foot was totally opposite of a human foot and that it doesn't look like a human foot in any way and that you lied when you said that human foots don't have those long toe bones. Anyone who looks at the bones of human feet as compared to the feet of other primates can tell you're lying. This is one of those rare instances where size really doesn't matter because we often have much more variance within a single species than between closely related ones. Look at the extreme variance in this collection of skulls, for example, and remember that these are all from the same species. All your critiques against primate evolution focus on variations of proportion that are all so slight as to be laughable were we to use the same criteria against the relatedness of dramatically different breeds of dogs. The human foot is designed to bear loads. Ida's foot is not designed to bear any load at all. Wrong again! Because one of the criteria of being a primate is that we're all plantigrade. That means we walk on the whole foot. Another trait is a tendency toward bipedalism, and this is especially obvious in lemurs, who are all almost exclusively bipedal. That means the hind leg bears the load of the whole animal. But Ida's heel didn't have to be very big because she didn't weigh very much. Later, lemurs grew to human sizes, proving you wrong again, not just because of the weight load, but because there's yet another line of predominantly bipedal, werewolf-looking things that are all now extinct and nothing like the samples we have left. So we go over here, we have shark teeth, fossilized shark teeth. Huh. We have sharks today, they haven't changed a bit. Sharks are a very old order, and have consequently changed quite a lot, in fact. Very few things haven't. But not everything has to. The way evolution works is you start with a generalized template, and that derives into more specialized subsets. When a new divergent clade emerges, the parent clade may continue indefinitely. Both will continue to diversify from there, and everything produced in one troop will still belong to that clade and to the umbrella clade as well. 
Also, another point I'd like to point out that nobody has talked about. The fact that Ida has a monkey's tail. It's problematic when you look at Ida as a transitionary creature, where's the other transitions losing the tail? So we'd have a little less, a little less, a little less, not this snap, all of a sudden no more tail. You can't explain that without providing more and more and more and more transitional creatures. And this is where we find it impossible and improbable. You have to have a pro proliferation of transitional creatures to make this so. Or I could just show you the Manx, a breed of domestic house cat that originated on the Isle of Man in the United Kingdom. It's completely tailless. It descended from normal long-tailed house cats directly to having no tail at all. Snap! All of a sudden. I know you think that's impossible, but there it is. However, that is not what happened when our ancestors lost their tails. That, oddly enough, occurred through the very sequence you asked for. A series of successions in the fossil record, and each one having left karyotypes that are still around today. As many transitions as you'd need to see, from a functional tail to a useless one, to a short one, to just a nub, to one you can't see anymore at all without an x-ray. That's why creationists shake their head and say, no, it's unlikely that we descended from monkeys. Or but curiously, what you think of as logical and even likely is that the mythological equivalent of a genie said abracadabra and conjured trillions of infinitely vast and complex galaxies out of literally nothing, all fully developed just like that. Yet out of every grain of sand on every beach there is that we're all instantly imagined into being in the same sneeze, somehow the one grain we live on was the first one, and that one took your god four whole days of constant spell casting to get done. Obviously, this story was written from the perspective of someone living on that grain who had no knowledge of the true state of the cosmos. Neither do you know your own true state. If you doubt that humans descend from monkeys and apes, then how do you explain our systematic classification? I've put forth the argument, as yet undisputed, that humans are still monkeys right now. We're in a special subset called Old World Monkeys, to be precise. And then in a subset of that are apes, and in a subset of that are great apes, so named because of our considerable size. This is easily proven, too. Look it up. Even Wikipedia will do if you look up the word hominoidia, the taxonomic word for ape.